Development begins with fertilization, the process by which the male gamete, the sperm, and the female gamete, the oocyte, unite to give rise to a zygote. The gametes are derived from primordial germ cells or the PGCs that are formed in the epiblast during the second week and that move to the wall of the yolk sac. During the fourth week, these cells begin to migrate from the yolk sac toward the developing gonads where they arrive by the end of the fifth week. The process by which gametes are formed is called gametogenesis. In this lecture video, we begin our discussion with the development of the female gametes called oogenesis. Then we will discuss how the male gametes were formed during spermatogenesis. The development of female gametes through meiosis and cytodifferentiation is called oogenesis. The primordial germ cell arrive at the gonad and can undergo mitosis division in order to proliferate. Later, it can differentiate to form the oogonium. The oogonium can also undergo mitosis to produce more oogonia. By the end of third month, this will become arranged into clusters that are surrounded by flattened epithelial cells, which originated from the surface epithelium of the ovary. Some of the oogonia differentiate into primary oocytes and become arrested in prophase 1. Just imagine, this prophase 1 may last as long as 40 years or even more and finishes only when the cell begins its final maturation. Figure A shows the fourth month of prenatal development. Here you can see that the oogonium has divided to form several oogonia, forming clusters of cells that are surrounded by a single layer of flattened epithelial cells that originated from the surface epithelium of the ovary. These flattened epithelial cells are called follicular cells. Some of the ogonia would also develop to form the primary oocytes that are arrested in prophase 1 of meiosis. By fifth month, the total number of germ cells would have reached its maximum of 7 million. Some of these would become atretic. Figure B shows the seventh month of prenatal development. Most algonia would have degenerated except those that are found at the surface. And all surviving primary oocytes would have already entered prophase 1 of meiosis. Each of the cells are surrounded by follicular cells called primordial follicle. By the time the baby is born in figure C, the newborn would have primary oocytes found within growing follicles, and they are estimated to be somewhere between 600,000 to 800,000. The cells are arrested at the plutin stage of prophase 1 because of the presence of the oocyte maturation inhibitor that are secreted by the follicular cells. Take note that most of the primary oocyte become atretic during childhood so that by the time puberty is reached, approximately 40,000 primary oocytes would be left, and there are fewer than 500 primary oocytes ovulated. Let's take a look at the different stages of development of the follicle, which is made up of the follicular cells and the oocyte. Figure A shows the primordial follicle. Notice that the primary oocyte is surrounded by a single layer of flattened cells. In figure B, you see the growing follicle. The follicular cells change from flat to cuboidal and the follicular cells proliferate to form the granulosa cells. The granulosa cells 
secrete glycoprotein, which eventually forms the zona pellucida, which is shown in red color. A pool of growing follicles are established at puberty. Every month, around 15 to 20 follicles are selected to mature from this pool. The primary follicle shown in figure C is consists of a stratified layer of granulosa cells that rest at the basement separated from the stromal cells which are made up of variant connective tissue. This forms the theca folliculi. Some of the primary follicle continue to develop and soon become filled with fluid. This is the fascicular or antral follicle, where the fluid-filled spaces appear between the granulosa cells to form the antrum. The granulosa cells continue to surround the primary oocyte, forming the cumulus oophorus. As the follicles continue to grow, cells of the theca folliculi will organize itself to form an inner layer of secretory cells called the theca interna, which will secrete estrogen derivatives such as androstedione and testosterone. These are later converted by the granular cells into estrone and 17-beta estradiol. The outer fibrous capsule, on the other hand, is called the theca externa. You will also find small finger-like processes of the theca folliculi extending across the zona pellucida and interdigitating with the microvilli of the plasma membrane of the oocyte. These processes are very important for the transport of materials from the follicular cells going to the oocyte. In the next few slides, let's see if you can identify whether the micrographs are showing growing follicles, primordial follicles, graphene follicles, primary or secondary follicle. Let's begin. What kind of follicle is shown in this micrograph? If your answer is primary follicle, then you are correct. A primary follicle, recall, is consists of a primary oocyte with stratified granulosa cells that secrete the substance that forms the zona pellucida, labeled as ZP in this micrograph. What about this? What kind of follicle is this? The arrow is actually pointing at a primary oocyte. This is a primordial follicle that contains a primary oocyte that is surrounded by a single layer of flattened follicular cells. What about this one? Notice that there is the beginning of a fluid-filled space. Later on, that will become larger and larger, forming what you call as the antrum. So this is the secondary follicle. Inside, you will see the primary oocyte, the stratified granulosa cells that secretes the substance forming the zona pellucida, plus the beginnings of fluid-filled space, which will later on become the antrum. What about this one? This is your matured follicle or the graphene follicle. It consists of secondary oocyte, corona radiata surrounding the secondary oocyte, and then the very large antrum that is filled with fluid, plus the theca folliculi, which divided into theca interna and theca externa. Now let's talk about the development of the male gametes through meiosis and cytodifferentiation, which is called spermatogenesis. The maturation of the sperm begins at puberty. 
Spermatogenesis, which begins at puberty, includes all of the events by which the spermatogonia are transformed into spermatozoa. At birth, the germ cells in the male infant can be recognized in the sex cords of the testes. These would appear as large, pale cells surrounded by supporting cells. The supporting cells, which are actually derived from the surface epithelium of the testes, will later on become sustentacular cells or the Sertoli cells. Hormones would also regulate spermatogenesis. Example, the luteinizing hormone stimulates testosterone production, which binds to the Sertoli cells to promote spermatogenesis. The follicle-stimulating hormone also binds to the Sertoli cells to stimulate testicular fluid production and also the synthesis of androgen receptor proteins. Shortly before puberty, the sex cords will acquire a lumen and become the seminiferous tubules. At about the same time, the progenitor stem cells will give rise to spermatogonial stem cell. And at regular intervals, the cells emerge from this stem cell population to form the type A spermatogonia. Their production marks the initiation of spermatogenesis. The type A cells undergo a limited number of mitotic divisions to form clones of cells. And the very last cell that is produced is called the type B spermatogonia. The type B spermatogonia will undergo mitosis to form primary spermatocytes. The primary spermatocyte, which is still diploid, will enter a prolonged period of prophase 1, roughly around 22 days, followed by rapid completion of meiosis 1, forming the secondary spermatocytes. During the second meiotic division, these cells immediately begin to form haploid spermatids. Notice how successive cell generations are joined by cytoplasmic bridges because cytokinesis is incomplete since meiosis began. And so, a single type A spermatogonium as shown in this diagram will form a clone of gens germ cells that are connected throughout differentiation. To recap, there are two types of spermatogonia, type A and type B. Type B differentiates into primary spermatocyte, which undergoes meiosis 1 to form the haploid secondary spermatocyte. This will undergo second meiotic division to form the spermatids which will later mature to become the spermatozoa. The series of changes resulting in the transformation of spermatids into spermatozoa is called spermiogenesis. These changes include, number one, the formation of the acrosome, which covers half of the nuclear surface and contains enzymes to assist in the penetration of the egg and the surrounding layers during fertilization. Number two, condensation of the nucleus. Number three, formation of the neck, the middle piece, and the tail. And number four, shedding of most of the cytoplasm as residual bodies. The residual bodies will then be phagocytosed by Sertoli cells. In humans, the time required for a spermatogonium to develop into a mature spermatozoon is approximately 74 days and approximately 300 million sperm cells are produced daily. When fully formed, the spermatozoa enter the lumen of the seminiferous tubules. At this point, it is only slightly motile. From there, they are pushed toward the epididymis by contractile elements 
in the wall of the seminiferous tubules. The spermatozoa obtain full motility inside the epididymis. This diagram shows different possibilities by which the gametes could become abnormal. In humans and in most mammals, one ovarian follicle occasionally contains two or three clearly distinguishable primary oocytes, as shown in figure A. Although these oocytes may give rise to twins or triplets, they usually degenerate before reaching maturity. In very rare cases, one primary oocyte contains two or even three nuclei, as shown in figure B. Such binucleated or trinucleated oocytes die before reaching maturity. Meanwhile, when it comes to abnormal spermatozoa, spermatozoa that are abnormal are more frequent as compared to abnormal oocytes. And up to 10% of all spermatozoa would have observable defects. The head or the tail may be abnormal, the spermatozoa may be giants or dwarfs, and sometimes they are joined. The sperm with morphologic abnormalities lack normal motility and probably is not capable of fertilizing an oocyte. If the head is too large, it's possible that it would be too heavy for the flagellum to propel it forward. And if the head is too small, probably the genetic material inside is not sufficient or abnormal itself. Of course, if there is a short flagella, then the sperm would not be able to move properly. This ends our lecture on gametogenesis. The next lecture will be all about the first week of development, from fertilization to implantation. And until then, always remember, life is beautiful.